So welcome everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody to the June 9th, 2023 Sandag Audit Committee meeting. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask our interpreter, Ruth Monroy, to introduce her themselves and walk through how to access our interpretation services for today. Ruth? Yes, good morning, thank you. Um, the following announcement is for remote participants and I will repeat the message in English. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, por favor desplácese a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación, que es el globo terráqueo, y seleccione Spanish, español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en celular o tableta, presione los puntos suspensivos, luego Interpretation y luego el idioma. To use the interpreting feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are located and click on the interpretation icon, the world. Then select your language. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone or tablet, please press the ellipses, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, with that, would you please join me in the pledge? Again, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, and the people of the United States of America. As we move on, I'll just let the record reflect that we have a quorum in full attendance. So, with that, we will move on to public comments and communications. Do we have any members of the public that are wishing to speak? Thank you, Chair. We have one member of the public who'd like to speak. The original draw, you can go ahead when you're ready. So like as you guys do these audits, I just um, ask you to think about the what the SANDAG is engaging in, which is a UN agenda and it is treason. And, um, you know, like I've said to the other boards, I don't know if it's that you don't understand what's going on or you're just ignorant um, and or if you do know and you're just pushing it anyway but um, you know when we do things like um, put things in bonds um, like the taxes that are being accrued or toll roads so that it makes it so that you can't even um, repeal that tax because all of a sudden it's unconstitutional the problem is is that even just putting that tax forward it's unconstitutional so we need to be thinking about what we're really doing here and whether or not we are helping people or if we're pushing a, a global agenda that is set out to um, basically enslave the people. Um, you know, and it's the people's money that is being spent to do all of this stuff. And that's why I think it's very important that even, um, you know, the public have um, an oversight that is able to do more um, with saying what they want, because you guys say that you represent people or the people of these boards say that, and it's not really representing what the people want. It's literally representing what the UN and this global agenda wants. Um, and so to have people tack, be pay more to just drive around and have a basic necessity because you want to implement a new way of life, you're punishing the people. And so therefore you can't claim that you want everybody to thrive because it doesn't make people thrive. It actually keeps people from being able to see their families, get to work, do whatever. Um, and, you know, just the whole push for this um, type of transit is just very dangerous when, um, you know, you can't even provide the basic necessities um, like in the other, meetings I've said it's the bathrooms that are one thing that is really important for people if you want us to ride this kind of transit and engage in this um, new way of life but you're not providing the basic necessities that are possible to do um, even for free where you can make money off of it um, but the you know claim is always that there isn't enough money for certain things and so as you audit their performance i would um, ask that you look into things like that that they're not providing certain things to help people thrive or for this new way of transportation to thrive because people aren't going to want to ride it 
um, or use that and not drive if you're not providing things, even just for the workers and making it an environment that's conducive and that makes people want to come and tell people that, hey, my job is so great. Why don't you come work here? Instead, people are striking because they're not getting the things that they need. And so as you push this whole thing down the pipe, you know, really think about that. And if what you're doing is, is bettering the people's lives or enslaving them and pushing an agenda that you shouldn't be. Thank you, that concludes the public commenters. Thank you. So we'll then move on to the second item, which is the agency report. And we're fortunate to have Ray to join us and give us that. Thank you, Ray. Thank you very much, Chair Zito. Hassan sends his regards. He left yesterday to represent Sandag at the World Metropolitan Congress. And he's going to be presenting on how Sandag uses data and planning to advance regional projects. Um, <clears throat> earlier this week, I was in Detroit with uh, Council Member Fisher. We were at the National Association of Regional Councils, which is basically the MPOs like San Diego. It's the, it's the annual regional meeting. And um, I have to tell you, because I was super impressed with Sandag, um, we, we had one meeting which was for the major metros and we're, we're part of the major metros. And we, we were talking about bringing people back to work and we are way ahead of all of the other MPOs in terms of being having people working um, in, in a hybrid and office environment. There are MPOs out there that have um, people uh, in the office two days a week. Some are one day a week. Uh, there's even one MPO that has uh, one day per quarter is the requirement for their employees to come in uh, to the office. And so I think from a productivity perspective, the fact that, that we have people in here, we have 25% of our people here um, uh, five days a week, and the rest of them are here on a hybrid schedule that's a, it's three days in the office, two days remote. And so anyway, we're, we were, and the projects that we were working on too are so much more significant than some of these other MPOs. So it was really, I, I was really proud to, um, to represent Sandag there. Um, with that said, we received $140 million for Otay Mesa East uh, as part of the Trade Corridor Enhancement Program. So that project is moving forward nicely. We also received $1.1 million uh, grant for planning um, the low sand uh, for the, the eliminating some of the, the, the rail crossings over there. And um, lastly, we opened uh, four more miles of HOV lanes on um, I-5 as part of the North Coast Corridor Program with Caltrans. Um, in terms of some of the work that we've done with the ERP, uh, we've kind of, we've hired a project manager, uh, and we've we've put a team of three project managers onto um, this particular project. And our target go live date for the ERP system is January second, twenty twenty four, which is relatively aggressive. MTS has been working on their uh, ERP for seven years, and um, we're going to get ours done in two, maybe two and a half. Um, and, and it's because everybody's focused on it and there's, there's executive buy-in. Uh, so part of that is that we've put together a steering committee and the steering committee is um, led by me with Andre, uh, Melissa and Bill Paris on there. And we are between the four of us, we can make all of the decisions that need to be made in terms of changing uh, policy or procedure to make sure that the implementation can continue to move forward. A lot of times what happens is lower down in the organization, they go, we always have to do it this way, it doesn't work. Well, we have all the decision makers in the room once a week, we meet with our consultants to make sure that those are, are, are occurring, those conversations are occurring and that there's no bottlenecks going forward into the next week. Um, and we've also hired a change manager to help us move from where we're at today with our with our policies and procedures and also and people actually using the system, making sure that everyone's going to be uh, coming on board. And so as part of that, um, we have also mapped back to the uh, to the timeline, the corrective action plan uh, parts that are specifically tied to, the ERP system. So not everything in the contracts audit was ERP related. And so, uh, but what we've done is we've, we've tied those back in there. And in general, those will be finished at the end of this year. And we'll be giving more of an update on these uh, on, a, on a quarterly basis with Mary. So with that, that concludes my report. Thank you, Ray. Do we have any public comments on Ray's update? Thank you. We do have one public commenter, the original draw. You can go ahead when you're ready. So, I mean, like I was saying with the, you know, um, 
the CEO going and um, engaging in this world, um, you know, globalist um, agenda to share data planning and advantages, different things like that. I mean, we we tend to outsource way too much and all we're concentrating on is the climate and the action plan and we get all this money you get so much money that you get to use and it's of the people's money and it's to push that agenda and you know it's never been something where you've gone to the community and asked them through voting if they felt the need to push the environment over public health and safety and so, you know, I'm going to bring up the bathrooms again, because it's like you guys have these initiatives and programs and projects, but none of them include um, putting forward an initiative or program or project that brings in bathrooms to all of these um, transit locations that you want people to use. And it's available. We have all these cities talking about you know, getting advertising and making money that way and, you know, putting up things for people to have um, concessions and whatnot. But we never talk about the fact that you want them to ride that and there aren't bathrooms and all of these boards members even know that and they talk about how they've tried to use it and there wasn't any restroom. And so, you know, this company, all I had to do was look for two minutes. I mean, barely even that I had to type it in in a search engine and it came up a company that's helping LA um do this and they have been since like 2001 but it's called Outfront Dassault Street Furniture Inc it's a joint venture between Outfront Media and JC Dassault North America Outfront Dassault has been committed to the developing and implementing unique urban services and amenities intended to enrich the urban transit experience and revitalize public spaces at no cost to the city so through marketing and of the advertising media panels on the side of their street furniture they're able to finance the city's um, um, program and share the revenue so that they can put it in bathrooms. So they have bathrooms that this company maintains at no cost to anybody, but they're able to provide this service for the people that is a basic necessity. And then people make, you can make money off of it and buy more bathroom space. But I feel like this is something that nobody ever addresses yet. We have people striking and people, you know, um, talking about doing like drinking tours on public transit, yet there's not providing anything even for these workers. And so, like I said, just a minute ago, it's like, if you provide these things, people are going to want to work for you more so than not, and will want to um, entice people to come work with them as well. But if you can't provide these things and you want to sit here and audit these say, why isn't this ever um, brought up on any of the boards and, um, you know, when you talk about people thriving, it's like in, in this new way of life, then you better provide the basic necessity because it's really important because you guys can go to the bathroom whenever you want. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. Do I have any board member comments or questions on Ray's report? Agnes. Um, I just want to thank uh, Ray and management and Mary, you know, working together on the corrective action plan. Uh, it's really encouraging to hear, you know, all the progress we have made, you know, hiring a project manager, a change manager, have a very aggressive, I agree, aggressive uh, timeline to finish the implementation. But thank you for the update. It's very helpful. Yes, uh, thank you. And I did just because this relative to many of the audits that we've done, um, this corrective action plan was probably less uh, f less complete than what we would normally see with respect to dates and that kind of stuff. So I have asked Ray or whoever is representing management, hopefully we'll always be fortunate enough to get Ray, but I don't know if that'll be the case to give us an update at every meeting just on where things are at. And they can be short, but it's just to let us know that progress is continuing and, and that kind of stuff. So I appreciate it and thanks for jumping in and doing that. Uh, with that, we'll move on to, oh, Stuart. Thanks, yeah, I was actually gonna ask about that. I appreciate you bringing that up, Chair Zito. Um, just for me, if it would be helpful if you could uh, format-wise try to put the updates into that um, sort of chart-like format that we've seen for other corrective action plans, just um, because the way my mind works, frankly, just hearing a lot of stuff, it tends to, have a, I have to have a hard time tying it back to what the goals are and whatnot. So if over the, if Mary's nodding, I presume you will work with those guys to try yeah, to Yeah, so do that. just real brief, um, 
Chair Zito is just looking because it's such a big corrective action plan, looking for not just a quarterly update where yeah. actually what you're speaking about will come to you, but more of a continuous update on how's this going? You know, how are we moving along? A sort of a verbal, how's it going? Are there any kinks and how are we move along? On a quarterly basis, um, that's where we actually have, who Mike's assigned to this, reaches out to all open corrective actions, including other audits, and ask those individuals for an update. And then on a quarterly basis, especially around the OPA corrective actions, we come to you and show, management first presents and shows what they've done to date, and then I respond in what I've reviewed in my um, perspective on it. And so that will happen on a quarterly basis. Okay, maybe it's just me. I guess I would say appreciate the ambition to do it monthly. Um, but frankly, just hearing the verbal report without having the context of the master plan just makes it a little in one ear out the other for me. So if there's an ability perhaps to even do a sooner than quarter's weight on updating that master plan chart that was presented that would just that would be helpful for me and I'll, I'll let you know ray think the only thing i can say about that is that's pretty aggressive i mean quarterly even on some of the corrective action plans for this um, particular audit is 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 aggressive because getting something accomplished in as far as the tasks that I've identified that need to be accomplished in three months is 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 going to be hard. So I mean that's doing it monthly. I, I can't say that there would be uh, every month something that actually gets accomplished. Yeah, and I mean, or, just, if I could just to be try to be helpful in what I'm asking for, maybe at a minimum it would be useful that while we're having the discussion, we do have that master plan up on the screen so we can be referencing the verbal updates against the master plan. Maybe it could be as simple as that as a starting place. Yeah, and I think, again, from my perspective of adding this is, you know, we have to be careful about adding too much work. And I think just mm -hmm. having a visual of what that looks like would be fine, understanding that it may not be accurate because it wasn't updated. Um, I was just, my intent is largely to make sure this body, in addition to management, is keeping focus that this is an important activity. So just having a verbal update helps us keep that focus and understand it is an important activity um, without creating a little bit too much extra work on creating a detailed update every time. So I'm kind of happy with the verbal every couple months and then or verbal every month until we get the quarterly update myself. Um, but I understand your desire to want to look at something but we just have to realize if we're looking at something that might be out of date. And also, if if that's going to be the, the direction we go, you have to also understand that we have limited resources. So quarterly is even hard for us to make sure we're capturing everything and then actually looking at it and determining if if it's, you know, something that's actually good work and does work. Um, so to do that monthly would be a lot of work on us. So. Yeah, I think the the other thing that's really complex here is that the 98 points with it between the two plans are they're not all at the same level. Right. Like it could be, you know, implement a PMO office is one, and then another one is write an SOP for a very specific thing, and another one has nothing to do with with our group. It's like you know, it's like it's board policy 17 that that's outside of our realm, and so. The, there, there's the intent and the spirit of all of those bullet points, and we're taking those into account, especially when you look at the ones that are related to the ERP. But most of those will not be done until the end of the year when we implement. That's when they all all happen. So we can give you progress on where we are with 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 some of those, but it's not like it, as clear as it was with, for instance, the PCARD audit, which is put a policy in place where you, you're a form, you know, we, we created a form and then you fill this out and then you can charge these things, those things you can't charge. Those type of things are really easy to check off. These are a little bit more complicated because some of the SOPs are are SANDAG processes that can't really be revised until after we have the ERP, and some of them are built into the ERP. So I'll do my best at trying to categorize those onto that back onto that sheet. But with some of them, though, I don't know that I can give you a date except for the date that they're going to be implemented. 
but and, and I can't really speak to which ones those are yet because we haven't actually gone through and and said this is the mapping in terms of time for each one of the 98. We just know when we're when we're taking care of it. And then we can, of course, can't yeah. test it until it's been implemented to determine if it's working. Okay. So, uh, I know, so Agnes, wait, sorry, Spirit. Spirit. if I could take one more the, crack at the, this, and then well, I know Agnes wants to jump in. Yes. I have a couple of things on a different topic. Um, I, I guess maybe a different way of saying it is. And I, I respect that this is a very weighty, meaty, complex corrective action plan scenario, unlike others, uh, right, that we've seen. But what we saw at, at the audit committee meeting was, frankly, it was it was really kind of like a backbone. It wasn't, uh, you know, what I would actually consider to be like a real plan yet. And so part of what I'm asking for is, as you're working towards this, if there's going to be a bit more of the plan fleshed out, it would be helpful to see a more fleshed out plan. Now, I get what you're saying. You kind of, it sounds like you sort of have in your head what needs to get done with great clarity. It would just be helpful for us okay. to, if you could actually just flesh it out a little bit more on that original backbone that we saw in the well, last Well, I think meeting. a good milestone for that will be whatever gets presented to us for the first quarterly update is like, this is what it looks like and this is where we're at. Might be too late, but I mean, I'm assuming that's what we'll get to see then. So yeah, Agnes, I'm, I'll let her. Yeah, so much uh, because it's so complex and there are a lot of findings, right? At 98 points, whatever. I think it's, even if we have it in front of us, it's really hard to assess, are we making good progress? And actually, I would like to see something maybe between Ray and Mary that can come together and look at, you know, so for example, the ERP uh, implementation, Give us quarterly assessment. Okay, maybe just simple, almost like traffic light green, yellow, red. Are we on track or green? We are, you know, a little bit off, maybe yellow, or we are off red. That way, we have some higher level rather than looking through all these findings, because you know it, it's tough to and I, get and a I, sense that we are on on track or not. Right? Yeah, and I think that the corrective action plan that we brought to the audit committee was incomplete. I think that the the task here is that we were going to go back and that yeah. you guys are going to fill out and do a full corrective action plan with more defined dates and specifics as far as how it's going to be corrected and who's going to be in, in responsible for that. I mean, that was my understanding. Yes, but it's not like we can put a team on it and then start checking them off one at a time because they're not linear. They're tied to implementation of the system in many cases. Right. And like you said, many of those can't even be tested until after the fact. Yeah, and we, so, we can't test it until after the fact, but I think they're more looking for a completed full cap that says, here's what needs to be fixed, here's how we're going to fix it. And one of those fixes could be the ERP system, which will be implemented in January and then tested in January. So I, I don't think that we have that yet. No. Yeah. So I think that's what is being asked. Yeah, it's, it goes back to it. You know, when I was referring at the meeting, a project management approach to this, right? Because if if you don't have tasks to find people responsible and target dates, then it's just sort of luck that something actually positive happens, right? You, you have to be intentional. So I agree. I think Mary's characterization was perhaps more eloquent than mine. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. And... Uh... And I think you had a couple other items, Stuart. Yeah, just so, um, you know, and also to what echo Agnes's comments, really appreciate that what you've described, Ray, is already a tremendous amount of progress. So I don't want that to get lost in my prior comment. Um, was part of the deal to actually be hiring a new person to be overseeing contracts area? And is there any progress on that? Well, yeah, so we've been interviewing and we have an offer out to somebody that we hope will accept that offer, oh, but great. they have not yet okay. done that. But we've been looking for the past four or five months. It's a very difficult position to fill because from our perspective, they need to have experience with um, the type of, of funds that we usually allocate, federal and state funds, color of money, and they understand how these contracts are written. And there are very few people who, who really fit that criteria. But we have a really good candidate right now that we would like to bring on. Very cool. And then just last, you know, I really appreciated um, um, Council Member Fisher's comments at the board meeting today and yours uh, um, about Detroit. I started my career doing municipal finance, and so I've worked with a lot of 
uh, financings for transportation agencies and without naming any, I got to say, it is only that experience only deepens my appreciation for the excellence of Sandag staff, the ambitions of the agency, and also, frankly, uh, the board members who, um, you know, who work so hard to kind of keep up <laughs> with the agency. And in, in that regard, I was curious, you know, there were quite a number of comments around the bond measure today. I think that the um, uh, John Kirk's very eloquent explanation of fiduciary responsibility may have seemed a little intimidating to some people who don't have experience with bond measures. Was there any sort of like official statement 101 that was done to help board members actually understand what John was saying is their responsibility to understand, you know, to review and undertake as part of approving the bond measure? I, I don't know that there was a a 101. I know this was the second time we brought it to the board. Right. So some of some of it may have been covered the first time. I think a lot of the misunderstanding here was potentially tied to the fact that we didn't do a good job explaining that due to the current economic circumstances with what's happening with interest rates and inflation, that this is actually a really good time for us to save money by refinancing these bonds and lowering our risk in our portfolio and lowering the amount of money we pay on on, on bonds that we've already issued and spent. This isn't new money that we're trying right. to to borrow. This is this is refinancing monies that that we've already used for other projects. And I think then it seemed to me that a lot of the comments were on on that in terms of the misunderstanding. But um I I I think we talked about it the the, the previous week, but if not, you know, we probably need to do a better job of that. Great. Thank you. Well in general the Staff's been doing there. There's been a lot of gaps with respect to onboarding new board members to begin with, and staff's done a much better job. So there's always more opportunities, but I certainly appreciate the work that staff's gone into with respect to onboarding new board members because there's a lot to learn when you come on this board. <laughs> Just kind of fits into that category as well. So let's moving it along. Um, we now have item number three, which is the OIPA office update. Mary. Thank you. This will be quick. Um, we do have one uh, update that I wanted to provide, and I and Chair Zito is aware of this, and, and I've spoken with um, with Ray as well. We started our last one of our last audits um, for the fiscal year, which was major minor asset um, management review. Sort of an it's an, a review of inventory, basically. Um, we started a preliminary review and looked at just the initial. Uh, policies and procedures, which is a typical standard practice of, you know, first looking at policies and procedures and then pursuing it from there, questionnaire, internal control questionnaire. And during this review, we identified that there are some no really formal written policies and procedures. There may be some documented policies and procedures um, here and there, not necessarily formalized. Um, there is also some inventory going on, but not consistently and not done across the board um, and not always timely. So we determined um, after speaking with Ray that the, the best use of our audit resources and and staff, Sandex staff resources, in fact, um, is to cancel the audit and issue a management memo, um, basically identifying that the result of the audit is going to be that they really don't have any consistent policies and procedures. So rather than waste those resources um, that we can surely put somewhere else, we did a management memo and requested that um, Ray and his team produce a corrective action plan that in, involves implementing formal written policies and procedures and a inventory system that is consistently applied across the board to all assets, major and minor, and that we would work with them in monitoring that. Um, they have 90 days to um, develop that corrective action plan and then to start implementing it. I think it should take about approximately a year to get it full up and going. It's not something that's gonna, you don't need a new ERP system to do this. Um, uh, we'll get it implemented and then it will go on the fiscal year 24, 25 audit plan to where we've been able to give it almost a year of implementation and then we'll do a full audit at that point in time. I just think that that's a, a benefit to the organization. Um, 
and both of our resources to, to go about it and do it that way. So we'll be working jointly um, with Ray and helping them and guiding them. We can't develop it for them, but we can guide them um, and help them get a corrective action plan and then get it implemented. And that's, so that's the plan. Um, I have no other updates other than that. Great, thanks, Mary. Um, Francesca, can we have our comment? Thank you, Chair. The original draw, you can go ahead when you're ready. I know you don't want to hear from me. It's all good. Um, but just I'm, I'm kind of questioning why are all of these um, inconsistencies taking place? Is it because you guys don't have the um, staff to, you know, be consistent and make sure that you are up to date with all of your stuff? And so therefore you have to now outsource that. Um, because you guys, as well as the other boards, have a fiduciary responsibility um, to ensure um, that the beneficiaries are the ones benefiting. Um, and that's why even just the confusion with the board earlier and that, um, you know, people shouldn't be voting if they don't understand what their responsibility is. So I guess if this is, if the reason that you have to outsource is because you aren't competent or don't have the staff, I, I'm curious as to know why, but if it's going to keep you guys consistent, then you would be upholding that responsibility to make sure that um, we are benefiting from your services. But yeah, so I just, not like you're going to answer me, but it is that I just would like to know if if the reason why it's not being consistent is because of people's lack of ability to do so, your lack of staff, um, and how long has this been taking place, um, and the fact that it'll take a year to um, kind of come back and fix uh, just seems a little bit like that takes quite a long time. So it'd be nice if you could answer that, why you're actually not consistent. Thank you, that concludes the public commenters. Thank you, Francesca, and thanks for the update, Mary. I guess as a point of clarity, though, my assumption is even though we didn't have a formal audit done, that the corrective action plan will still come to this committee once it's ready and we'll get to review that. Um, absolutely, so in 90 days, I'll review the corrective action plan and give some recommendations if necessary, and then that will be the first quarter that will actually um, is due uh, to come back to the audit committee for any corrective action plan. So okay. that's um, how that's sort of how I put it in is that timeline is to make sure at that point the audit committee can see it and and know that it's alive and moving along. Yeah, no good. And I appreciate that uh, both just from the perspective of the audit team and management realizing that this is a, a more efficient and effective way to go and a better use of our resources. So that was really good to see and appreciate this path forward that we've developed. Any other board member comments or questions on this item? I, I agree. I echo that. Uh, I think, you know, the focus, you know, should be moving forward, right? How do we, uh, if we see a gap and how do we you know, correct it? So I appreciate, you know, the collaborative approach. Great. With that, we'll move on to item number four, which is the approval of the minutes. I'll note that the agenda incorrectly lists the minutes from April 14th. The minutes are actually from the May meeting. And I will also note the last the table on the last page of the minutes incorrectly lists Council Member Musgrove as a public member unless he's quit and decided to come in that way as well. And so we should probably note that he's a board member as well on the last page. Otherwise, with that, uh, do we have any public comments on the minutes? Thanks, Chair. We have no public comments. Okay. And any board member comments? Otherwise, I entertain a motion to approve. I'll move approval. Thank okay. Moved by Drucker. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Monson. Can we please have the voting screen? And Agnes is a... Oh, I need to power this on. I learned that from last time. It helps if it's on. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So with that, we will move on to... Um, our reports, the first report item is number five, update on the independent performance auditor recruitment. And uh, I'll let Stuart or Bob start off with this. Okay. Um, yeah, we're at the point now where we, um, the the ads have been, been sent to, initially, I think we were sending them to 14 professional um, 
audit organ or just 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 say professional audit organizations. And 14 there. Uh, an email blast has been sent to over a thousand possible recruits as well as source referrals from the recruiter. Um, what we're waiting on now are just the resumes, and we haven't seen any yet. Uh, we are supposed to receiving we're supposed to be receiving a batch of resumes um, close of business today. Um, as a subcommittee, along with the recruiter, we will be reviewing all of those resumes to determine um, who's going to actually be invited to the screening interviews that will be conducted by the subcommittee as well as the recruiter. Um, and then from there, uh, we'll select a short list as to who's going to come to the audit committee and um, be interviewed by the entire audit committee. As far as the dates are concerned, uh, there's been no change with that. Uh, we're still, the last res uh, resume is to be sent in on the 26th. And the idea, I think, is that right after the 26th, on the 27th, the subcommittee will, will meet to determine who's, who's going to be invited to the screening interviews, and then we'll proceed with the screening interviews on the 28th, uh, hopefully get those wrapped up so we can determine um, a short list to bring to uh, the audit committee. And that's kind of where we stand at right now. And Stuart has something to add. Uh, yeah, I, I would just say, um, uh, you know, um, at, at this morning's board meeting, I think somebody wrote for Vice Chair Ila Rivera what I would characterize as a little bit of happy talk about this process. I think um, nobody should misunderstand that this is probably going to be a, a fairly challenging search process. And so I, you know, I get that everybody's all like, yes, we're, we're off, we're running, but let's all just keep in mind that there's probably going to be some challenges along the way here. But um, we haven't seen any of the first resumes yet, and we'll certainly be reporting back. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can share. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty well known in the government across California as far as auditors. So I've had a lot of auditors reach out to me and inquire. Um, some of them I have blasted out the, the link and um, without even really looking at it in detail myself. And many responses were, when did you get an office in Lodi? Um, because initially, I guess it advertised that the location was Lodi, California. <laughs> versus San Diego. So I had to explain to them that that was probably a typo because the last time I checked, there is not an office in Lodi um, that we are located here in San Diego. But, you know, a lot of the auditors shared that that they did not feel that the board was as supportive towards the auditors and the audits here at Sandag. And so they were kind of resistant to apply because for an auditor, it's really important that you get support from the board, especially when you report to the board. And so they were a little weary of that. I have shared with them that there was some growing pains and I think that that's getting better, much better. And I, I perceive it getting much better in the future. So I encourage them still to apply. Um, I think we've come a long way and I think, you know, Ray and I work really, really good together. I think he is an advocate of improvement and, and better operations. And, and I think that that's really important to have that. So um, I encourage them to apply and I hope that they do. Just um, one comment and it kind of dovetails into what Mary said about there was an ad that was sent to LinkedIn that did have Lodi um, uh, City on it and a couple of other things that, that needed to be changed that has since been changed. All the other ones that were sent to the various professionals, those were all correct. Um, um, so there weren't any problems with that. And then the second comment I want to make kind of dovetails into what Stuart said. I don't want anybody to think that this is going to be an easy recruitment. I don't think it is. Uh, I think this is, is somewhat unique. Sandy is a complex organization. And um, uh, so, so we as the subcommittee um, need to be very, very cautious about um, who we bring before you. Uh, we want to bring in the best candidates. Um, um, Mary was a, is and has been a great auditor for this organization. She's developed a, a staff 
we want to bring in somebody equal to that or even better. Um, we could find somebody better than Mary, I'm not sure. But uh, um, uh, <laughs> but again, I just want to emphasize that yeah, there's, this, this could be a challenging recruitment, and I don't want to make it sound like it's going to be a piece of cake. Um, I'm still not sure about the dates. This is an aggressive um, recruitment. But uh, I know Stuart and I, and, and we've discussed this with the recruitment as well as Luce, that, you know, if we start getting uh, kind of stuck, um, we may have to come back to this audit group and come back to the board said we need to, you know, adjust these dates a little bit. Because uh, again, our focus is bringing the best candidate. So far, you know, it, we're, we're, we're sticking to the date. So we haven't uh, convinced you to come out of retirement yet, Bob? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Before we devolve into anything that... You know, and if I could just add, just for clarity, if anybody's wondering, Bob's talking about the dates. Um, you know, the, the Sandic board is historically dark in August, right? right? And so we're really trying to compress the schedule to make sure we, it gets teed up. To we'll talk that more about account. that. Yeah. Figured we could go get our... Hear from the public... Oh, sorry. And then, okay. uh, and then start a little bit more discussion. So, Francesca. Thank you. We have one public comment. The original draw, you can go ahead. Um, so, I guess, uh, why would one of the ads say Lodi on it? Is it something where you guys were copying and pasting and taking something that Lodi? I mean, I just don't understand why that would be taking place. Um, because that's a pretty big mistake if someone was typing it out themselves and then presenting that. Uh, it doesn't make sense why Lodi would be in there, but it would if somebody's copying and pasting and kind of being negligent and putting the ad out because then you are keeping people from um, being able to reply. And the fact that you don't have any resumes yet, I mean, are you spending your money and time wisely, you know, um, sending only a thousand emails out or who's picking these thousand um, people or entities that you're reaching out to and only 14 ads. I just feel like if you guys know that it's going to be so hard, maybe you should be um, working harder to get it out there. But also just the fact that um, before what was said about um, them not really wanting to come and take this job because they don't believe that the board will listen. Um, you know, I don't know if that's something you need to be talking to the entire board about and making sure that they're going to be open to this type of person because you can't just really tell them that um, that's not going to happen um, when, I mean, nobody likes to be audited. So they have a job that, you know, you're, you're bringing things forward that um, the board may not want to acknowledge. So, um, you know, an all around kind of change needs to happen where people are more willing to, um, you know, be called out upon things that maybe they're not doing that are um, productive um, to, you know, um, what your job is. So I just think, um, you know, if it's going to be that hard, maybe not making mistakes like putting Lodi in the advertisement um, and actually writing an ad out yourself, um, but also ensuring that you can do something to make sure that the board listens, um, as opposed to just kind of saying, well, we'll make sure that they do or whatever. That's it. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. Um... So yeah, my understanding, when did the, uh, just quite a couple of questions, when did the ad get posted, do you know? And what is the overall, if, if the 26th is the deadline, what is the overall time frame? Um, okay, well, yeah, I wanna be um, a little careful with my words. I can't say with 100% certainty when the ad was placed. Okay. Um, you know, it'd be perfectly candid, we've had, we've had some struggles in coordinating some of this stuff with the recruiter. Um, we've, we've been trying and I think it's getting better. Um, but as far as the overall timeline, again, it goes back to trying to sort of squeeze the process to have the final um, candidate go before the board by, uh, by the time that they're gonna go on their August recess. Yeah, and my, I mean, at least relative to other recruitment processes that I've seen, are you expecting, so for example, I, I believe you, you even as a subcommittee probably won't see a lot of the resumes until there's a bunch of applicants, I would assume. Um, my understanding from staff, I mean, I don't think the ad's been out there that long. My understanding from staff is 
at this point. We have eight resumes and, and that have actually applied, of people have applied. And the other comment that was made is that a lot of times people will wait towards the end of the application process before they apply, just so they have enough time to get their uh, resume together, for lack of a better term. So um, with any luck, we'll see a bunch more, but I don't want that to detract from your comment is it's a, we also, you could have 40 people and, and none of those 40 might actually be qualified. So we don't know who the eight are yet, but it does seem like we've generated some interest. I will um, express that it's, unfortunately, I don't, um, I don't, I haven't seen the ad. Um, I wasn't even made aware that the ad got out there. So I do think if we could just get a link sent to the entire committee so we could all take a look at it of what, what it is and what it looks like. Um, the other thing is I do know that there's been some discussions between the recruiter and uh, at least she was planning on I mean, some discussions between the recruiter and various members, including board members of of uh, what would be looked for, uh, you know, uh, or topics around the new IPA. Um, and I would point out so far that hasn't happened between either the chair or the vice chair of the audit committee. So it's probably worth talking to the recruiter and saying, have a conversation with us as well. Um, you know, subject to, you know, we obviously can't participate in the subcommittee, but she can take our feedback as well. So that'd be something else that I think would be useful to have happen too, um, is to talk to um, David and myself on on uh, on things that we were, we were hoping to see in the recruitment process. But, and the last thing I, I did want to broach a little bit is, uh, so, do we do you does the subcommittee at this point in time have any idea or concept in mind what a minimum number of so if you you know you get all the resumes in what's a minimum number for pre-screening that you're going to say oh if you only have two that you're willing to pre-screen are you going to move forward or recommend keeping the process open longer have you talked about that at all yeah and feel free to jump in but um so what we've talked about conceptually is the notion of targeting at at minimum six, but maybe more in the range of eight, perhaps 10 as people to invite for screening interviews. It's, it's gonna all be subject to the quality of the pool, but in conceptual terms, that's very broadly what we've been looking at. And then just hypothetically, let's say if we have a screening population of eight, again, subject to the quality of the pool, but the, the goal would be to have probably, a, a, you know, a minimum, uh, an absolute minimum of three, if not four or five to bring to the full audit committee as to what we think are the strongest candidates. Right. And so criteria. my question was, is if you do the resume filtering and say, there's only three people here worth even screening, would you, you know, I assume at that point you would say, we need to extend the timeline or is that something that that you would do or has that been discussed as to, you know, we haven't we... discussed that exact okay. scenario, right. I guess, just off the top of my head, I would say if there are only three people who seem to be of sufficient quality, um, then we probably as a, that shouldn't be a Bob Stewart decision or recruit. I think we should as collectively have a decision as to whether well, we, we won't we'll... have the time because as it stands right now, I think the next audit committee meeting, we're supposed to be interviewing candidates. That's my understanding is how the schedule oh, works good, out. So, good point. Then, <laughs> so then we'll you screen. guys are going to be off and running as a subcommittee and I'm we'll trying to figure out special meeting. Um, <laughs> but no, but, but in all seriousness, right, yes. if, if we've got three candidates within this time frame who really really seem like super high quality candidates, I, I might say that we don't necessarily need to sort of screen three people. We could just bring three, those three people to the full committee. Yeah, although the right? screening could be, pre-screening could be helpful just to learn out more. But yeah, I mean, I would, I would like to think that if we can't, if there aren't three people qualified enough to bring to this board for interviews, we may want to consider extending the timeline. That That's yeah. kind of my yeah. concept mm -hmm. for feedback, right? Yeah, and, and, and Chair, I, I would agree with you. Okay. I think that if, if the subcommittee came through and we came out of this looking at resumes and we came up with one candidate, yeah, then we're going to have to start talking, or maybe even two. We're going to have to start talking about when we're going to need to extend the time period. But if we came up with three, um, I would not be opposed to to moving forward on that as well. Any other uh, committee member feedback, David? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, my background is a whole lot of recruiting. Um, not as as not as a paid recruiter, but as part of my job has been to recruit a whole lot of IT people. 
Um, and also I've done three city manager recruitments, one executive director of NCTD, and now I'm sitting in doing a uh, recruitment of CEA, CEO. So a couple things. One is um, best is the enemy of better. You know, let's let's get a really good candidate. We're not if we can't get the best, then then let's get a good candidate because that's what we want to get. Um, I would ask, you know, number two is I the recruiter should not be depending upon the ad. If this recruiter is not out there beating the bushes to uh, to get candidates in, then and that's what she promised she would do. Um, you know, we have a problem. So, you know, ultimately, I would think you would only want to have four or five or six um, candidates at most. After that, it just gets way too big. Um, the final thing is, I'm hoping that you will have standard questions for each of these candidates, that you will not be shooting from the hip in terms of just asking questions based upon a person's resume, but you will have apples to apples questions. And the same thing when we come to the board, that we will all have a standard set of questions that we're gonna ask so that we can ensure that we are not picking the first person or the last person. Because that's that's what happens when uh, you, don't, you don't ask standard questions. So um, to do that, the recruiter is gonna have to work with all of us to come up with those questions and you all too, to come up with those questions to make sure that we are getting a really good response from each of the of the, the candidates. And I would just echo what uh, Dave said, I've never been uh, um, talked to by the, by the recruiter about what the requirements I see are. And I think that's really important. I, I don't know if Ed is either. I don't know if Agnes has. Um, you know, this person's reporting to us and, and we should be telling them what are we, I know, you know, I think in the report it said they were talking to uh, some of the board members, but um, they've not talked to any of their board members besides you two. So I think it's really important before she comes up with, you know, she will also be coming up with a um, recommended list for you to to, to uh, interview, and she needs to have that understanding. It's not the generic advertisement that went out, that's wonderful. There are some other, I would say, soft skills that are probably not in that, but she needs to understand what, what we as board members are looking for. Yeah, I, I hear everything you're saying, and I respect your experience in the space. I think one thing everybody has to realize um, is that this is such a niche, unique kind of position that there is no recruiter in the world who can claim to have specific expertise here. And so we have to uh, sort of take into account when we think about what you might typically rely on a recruiter to do, we have to take into account that there is literally no recruiter in the world who has the specific enough information about this kind of job to frankly do some of the things that you typically rely on a recruiter for. So as when Bob mentions the fact that we're actually gonna screen all the resumes, that's not a typical process, mm -hmm. right? But the fact is once you get past the very clearly objectively measurable question of does somebody have a CPA or not, all the other stuff really depends very, very heavily on your knowledge of this very unique niche kind of job. And so in that context, you know, we're all committed to being very much more hands-on in this process. Um, but I absolutely hear everything that you're saying and, 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 and respect your, um, your perspective on this. But again, I just think it's important to remember, this is just so different because of the niche nature of the job. Even, even just the individual recruiter out, outreach, nobody other than people like Bob and people like Mary actually have real networks in this community. Right. You can it, typically you can expect a recruiter to say, well, I've done countless internal auditor. I've got a network, et cetera. So let's all just keep that in mind as we continue to go through this process. 
And then just a couple of comments, and I really thank you for making the comments that you did. Um, as, as far as, you know, uh, talking with the rest of the audit committee members, I think that's something that we need to address with the recruiter because we were told that she was going to do that. And um, the second comment I would make was about the questions. And you're exactly right. And that's one of the things that we, we meet with the recruiter on a, a weekly basis. Um, and I believe that's gonna be our next step at our next meeting as we start going over the questions that the subcommittee is going to do. And then we need to also, she actually mentioned that at our last meeting, we need to get to the audit committee members and, and see what questions do they wanna ask as well. So um, I think we're gonna cover that and we'll address the other issue with her probably after this meeting, I think. Um, as far as meeting with the audit committee members concerned. Just one other, other comment. Um, this is quite an aggressive schedule. Um, and if it can't be met because we don't have the correct candidates, then it probably is going to go into September and we will probably have to meet in August to figure this out. And I'm gonna and the chair having can't canceled the August meeting yet. Mm -hmm. You'll notice every other every sure. other subcommittee is dark in August. We are not at this yeah. point. So my understanding is that this schedule has really been driven um between by discussions between the chair and the recruiter, not by us. And I don't mean you, Chair. I mean No, no, I yeah, no, there, there is a desire to be aggressive about it, and I think it's our job to to uh, do our best to fill the spot with a capable candidate. And if no, nobody seems to apply in that time frame, we will have to extend the schedule, which is why I brought up the conversation I did to start this off, which is under the current schedule, next meeting, we're supposed to be doing interviews. So I would assume that if that's, if at the end of this month, you get to a spot where that's clearly not gonna happen, then it's gonna be, you know, you should have some clear cut decision. My, my, my objective would be, I mean, you mentioned five, Stuart. I'm kind of a lazy guy. I really would prefer not to interview five people. So three to four here, if we if we think we can get three to four people here, then then we're good. If we don't think we can get three to four people here, we should probably be looking to extend the recruitment time frame and maybe ask Mary to make some more calls or something as a key recruiter. <laughs> but, yeah, right. <laughs> so, yes, right. Well, and, so I'll just be thankful that Mary agreed yeah. to stay on through October of 2024. Yeah, that's helpful too, actually. And I'm very thankful to you guys for agreeing to stay on through the process as well. And so th thanks for all the help. Yes, I know. <laughs> yes. I figured I'd get it corrected in the minutes next time. <laughs> just okay. quickly, Chair. Uh, yeah, uh, the number to me is less important than the quality. If you whittle this list down, we only have two that we feel Fit the bill, then two it is. And holding it out, waiting for three, four, and five, we run the risk of losing those people that are qualified, that we could make a great selection. Um, it's better to pick the best of a good group than this is the best we can do with the group we have. So to, again, to me, the, the number is less important than the quality. And, and that's great feedback. I mean, I was frankly being a little deferential because, you know, different bodies want to exercise different degrees of decision making. And so we appreciate the trust that you guys are displaying that if, in fact, our best guess is that there are really only three worth talking to, then three is the number and it doesn't have to be five. Thanks. Okay. We good? Looks like we're good. Thanks. And again, thanks again for your work. Um, and uh, thanks again for Mary's work for going out and recruiting people that she knows. With that, we'll move on to item number six. I don't think we, this was just an update, right? Yeah, I don't think we have anything to act on. So item number six, which is the update on the independent performance auditor's performance review. Um, so one of the things that uh, I did have a brief up update just from the subcommittee on where, where, where they are at so far. And I think I will let you guys go ahead and give that update. One of the things that um, that Mary had done was sent the subcommittee the, the uh, annual results for the year. And I would like you know to give her an opportunity, even though we don't have that in front of us, maybe she could quickly walk through that 
and just let us know what the year looked like and um, and then I'll let the subcommittee talk and then we'll talk about where we're going from here. So I don't know if Mary, you're able to do that particular part of it. Uh, Quick. Yes, real, real quick. So um, I did send the results to Agnes and, and um, Ed, and we were, we've accomplished all of our goals as determined. It, I did share with you that we did um, change the asset management. So that's one audit that we're actually doing another audit in lieu of um, moving into the contract audit quicker, which is one of the contract individual contract invoicing is where we're shifting those hours. Um, I did have a pending on the results of the um, the participation of the OPA key goals achieved as far as the risk assessment. And I am happy to say that we have met with all the board members with the exception of one. So that's a, a really good accomplishment in my book. Um, so it exceeds the 80%, which is um, even, a, even above the target of 70%. Um, we met with all management with the exception of three and all the audit committee members, um, 100%. So that was very successful. Um, we were on target for everything. Uh, we allocated, changed the um, contracts and procurement audit from one audit to two. And I talked to um, Chair Zito about why we did that. Just as background information, we don't bring every time, as long as we're in the scope of the annual audit plan, anytime I make changes, I update those changes verbally to you in the audit committee, but I don't revise the um, annual plan and bring it to you unless it's outside the scope of the annual audit plan. Um, the annual audit plan is a budget, so it changes. And as long as we're in within that scope, we, we don't update it with the audit committee other than on a verbal state. Um, other than that, we've we've met everything, and I'm um, I'm really proud of my team because this isn't just a me, right? It's an us, and they accomplished that goal, and and they're the biggest part of it. So um, we were successful in that. Okay, thanks for that. And then maybe Agnes and Bob, if you'd like to go over, or, or Agnes and Ed. Why do I keep thinking Bob's on this one? Agnes and Ed. Yeah. Sorry, Ed. I don't mean to <laughs> knock your knock the, your your good contributions here, but no, we, we have taken advantage of Bob. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So uh, we have uh, been working with the uh, Sendec uh, HR folks uh, to send out a survey. We actually selected twenty one uh, uh, people. They are board members, other committee members, management, OIPA staff. And so far, as of today, we have received 11 of 21. Um, so, you know, half. And actually, I would like to, you know, extend the time a little bit more and then do one more push and reminder and hope that we get more than, you know, 50% response. And because of that, uh, well, but so far, I do want to report the majority of the responses are very positive uh, about Mary and her team. Um, there's some small number of constructive, uh, positive criticism that, you know, I think the intention is to help, you know, making improvement, right? So my recommendation is uh, that we will give open the survey for a little bit longer and then come back in our July meeting and have a closed session to go through those responses, including some of the recent comments. Um, and also I'm hoping too that we would, um, using this time between now and July, working with uh, Santa HR, looking at the compensation, uh, what Santa is doing you know, in general for all the staff as well as management. So give us some basis to make recommendation to the committee. So that's the report I have, Ed. Yeah, just, uh, I would just add on to that, that uh, Melissa has been very helpful, very responsive for us. Uh, we did run into some unforeseen issues, I think, with the survey programming. <laughs> um, it's helpful if somebody can receive the information and then the way it was set up, either by accident or design, um, there's really a primary recipient. So a great deference to Agnes. Agnes is the primary recipient. So we coordinate based on information that comes into her, but it's just a slow process. And Alyssa is going to reach out to those, to everyone that was a recipient, because we, you know, there's some degree of anonymity in these. If you haven't already completed it, please send it in as quickly as possible, thoroughly as quickly as possible. Thanks. Uh, with that, can we, do we have any public comment there? 
Francesca? We have no public comments on this item. Great, thanks. And yeah, thanks again for the work on the subcommittee. Um, similar to what we did last year, I like the approach. Um, I'm a little concerned because if we're gonna be doing interviews in July, I'll have to work with Mary on how all this is gonna come together. I don't know if we'll need an extra meeting in July or we'll see, but we'll we'll have to keep in touch and to work that out. But I do like, last year we did that approach, which was, I, I like the approach of initially, you know, hopefully we'll have it all wrapped up by then. Um, initially we'll do a closed session and then discuss if we just immediately want to go to open session or if we want to talk about anything in closed session and then continue with the rest of it in open session uh, as we see fit based upon that conversation. I think it works out well to do it that way. Um, so appreciate the effort on your behalf. I would encourage you, I think when my, I got the update about the subcommittee and um, you know, so nobody else has to feel bad about it, I'm, I'm guessing that all of the audit committee members were actually on the survey and I think they only had responses from half of the, the committee members. And I will freely admit because of the screw up of the survey, I was one of those that hadn't responded yet. And so I was happy to hear it extended because uh, May in May, uh, the survey, the, I finally got the email when I was out of town in May. Unfortunately, in May, the only two times I was here for the two board meetings I met, I was basically out of town 21 days in May. So I couldn't, uh, I fell a little behind. So I intend to do it over the next week. And I encourage anybody else on this committee that hasn't gotten to it's it. It's funny you say that, Chair, yeah. because uh, knowing who the yeah. recipients are, yeah, really fighting that urge to reach out to them individually, because then it kind of takes away that degree of, well, I, I feel freely to speak or write what I believe right. and just let the process handle Let Melissa be that right. third. Yeah, so good. So looking party. forward to it. So any other comments, questions? Uh, question? Oh, and then the other thing is part of the, um, I do think for the next meeting, uh, we can get a, a copy of um, Mary Kay's report circulated as part of the agenda as well, just the annual accomplishments. So we all have it in front of it. Us instead of just a verbal update. Yes, David, you had a comment? So I, I was just sure. gonna ask, I, I frankly can't recall, do you know who the email comes from? Because who it comes from may actually have some implications for the success. I believe it comes from SurveyMonkey. Well, but the email will show from clerk of the board. Oh yeah, the oh, last one okay. came from yeah, Tessa. Yeah, the last some one people look at those Tessa. and just yes. put them into the folder and say, well, I'll pick it right, up in the yes. next meeting. Okay, good. That's so the, yeah, the subject line can be extremely So it important. will come from Tessa, but the subject line should be relevant. Yes, David. Yeah, I have not received. Okay, we will uh, We will make sure that gets fixed. Yeah. Awesome. I, I check my spam folder <laughs> file <laughs> all the time. Okay, we'll make sure. Great, so thanks again. And let's see, so now we will move on to the Office of the Independent. Oh, actually, no, that, I had one more question for you, Mary, on that last one, which was I did notice and unfortunately I have an advantage over some of the board members because I do have that paper copy. I did notice that uh, that the last continuous audit item was noted as being merged with the above project. Um, and so did the, did you merge the hours or just merge the tasks? Cause the, so, so before the one was 500 hours, the other one 400 hours, you think you can get the same amount of work done in 500 hours based upon what you know now and that's why you merged them? Yeah. Okay, that's, so just as you see that next time, you'll notice that um, and I was just curious about it. Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, item number, let's see where we're at, we're at seven, which is the Office of the Independent Performance Auditor Proposed Audit Plan and this is you, Mary. Thank you. So uh, this is for new fiscal year uh, 22, 23, 24. And as you can see, most of the hours are allocated to now on a continuous auditing, which is what we've moved into, um, which is gonna be more efficient and effective. And it captures current uh, picture of what's going on today versus five years. So um, I'm really happy that we have moved, came come this far. Um, the first part of the, uh, hours that are being allocated are allocated for those top 12 identified in um, the contract and procurement audit, which is the ones we said we were going to go back and, and look at the invoices to make sure that they're all appropriate and everything. So that is our number one priority is to just go through those and get those done. And those are 12 the top 12. And then from there, we're moving into continuous auditing around contracts and procurement, um, travel and reimbursement, purchase cards, and then hopefully maybe at the end, we can we can pick up asset management if we have some time. 
but that's where our focus is, is really around contracts and invoicing. That is sort of, to me, the highest risk of the organization. Um, just one from what we found um, in the audit and the audit findings, but more importantly, it's inherently risky. The organization has a lot of contracts, um, high risk contracts, types of contracts are high risk. And so I think our focus around that area is the biggest risk for the organization and the, the best bang for our buck in that area. And then of course, picking up from what we've audited in the past because they're all working now on new policies and procedures. So we should assume that they're working great and they've been implemented. And so hopefully the findings will um, show that or the lack of findings will show that is what my hope is. And so with that, um, I can answer any questions. Great, thank you, Mary. Um, Francesca, do we have any public comment? We have no public comments on this item. Do I have any board member comments or questions? Ms. Wong Nickerson. So one quick question. So, um, so the continuous improvement audit, uh, some of that will be looking back a little bit, you know, based on the contract and procurement, but the majority is more prospective like currently. So it's a more current time frame, right? Uh, yes. Than looking back. So other than those 12, so those 12 we've identified, we are going back from 2019 forward mm -hmm. to make sure that we've captured the audit period time in which we audited and had concerns around that. And then the following continuous auditing that we move forward into the next audit section as far as um, the contracts and the reimbursement and travel and P-cards are all going to be like one and a half years. So that very current um, all the way from probably 2022 20, or 21 to, to current and how we'll take that as every other month. So we'll do a haphazard selection of mo by months or every other month and then do a continuous cycling of review around those. Thank you. Quick question, Mary. I, you kind of answered this for me. Um, um, going back to the continuous auditing, mm -hmm. um, is it pretty much a judgmental sample that, that you're doing for this? You're not yes. necessarily looking at everything. You obviously don't have the staff to do that right. uh, every month. So it's mainly judgmental. It is. It's it's haphazard and judgmental. Based on judgmental would be the higher risk contractors. So we would be selectively picking those because we know they're higher risk. So it is a judgmental selection. And then haphazard, we would throw the other one sort of in the bucket and take a random selection. Is there some type of database that you you use to determine those kinds of contracts? Yeah. So the vendor table would give us every contractor that's been paid out from Sandag. So that would hopefully be 100% of that population. And what about the, per, the P card transactions and travel and stuff? So travel and uh, so travel, we would take all the employees. Again, I think most of the employees are identified as a vendor. Is that correct, Mike? Um, kind of, yes, like they're in the vendor table, but there's like different delineations, like an actual contractor will be V, like the letter V and then a an ID number and employees. It's been a while since I've looked, but it's either like P or E and then a number. Okay. But they're in the that table last we checked. Are there specific things that you're looking for? I know when, when I was at the port, we have a we had a specific program mm -hmm. that the auditors would run that were, were keen on areas that we noted as areas of greater risk. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones that would pop up when we so we'll look for, um, of course, weekend, again, weekend types of reimbursements. We'll look for um, expenditures that just are just below or divided by two of the minimum uh, before you have to go out and bid or you can purchase through a purchase card. We'll look for non-acceptable, like things you shouldn't be purchasing on the purchase card. We'll also look to for employees adhering to the GSA rate, the new policy that's in place is they have to follow the GSA. So we'll look for those. And we're also going to look for business needs, right? So it has to be meet the business need of the organization. So if you're going to go on a trip and it doesn't meet a business need, that would be a finding. So we're looking at business needs, are they within the policies, which is the, the GSA rate? Are they following that? Um, and are they within the guidelines of what the purchase card is supposed to be used for? Uh, one more question that I know that some 
other uh, organizations, and I don't know if that tool is available to you now, is to use those like data analytics, almost mm -hmm. like what bank does, right? Oh, these are unusual transactions yep. and flag them, so we can look into them more. A Do lot of like that. Yes, yeah, so we have we have great tools. They're called Crystal Mike and Dog. <laughs> 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 and so data analytics is Excel can be data analytics used with Excel is a great tool. So um, do we go out and purchase data analytic tools? It's not needed. We have Excel. It's a great tool. And we have three individuals that are really good in data analytics. Definitely we use data analytics in all of our audits because we couldn't possibly do it without it. It's just, it's, it's how we narrow down to a bite size ability to actually audit such a, a, a lot of numbers in the organization and a lot of transactions in the organization. So yes, definitely data analytics. Okay, so I see. So basically you're saying you don't need to buy any, you know, off the shelf kind of product because you can do data dumb and then just uh, Yeah, actually Excel data analytics Excel has really good tools for data analytics. So I don't know, Bob, is if that's what you use, but yeah, it's a you it's a good use tool. Excel mm -hmm. and their analytics and yeah. And they're very good. Very yeah. Good. But you do need to have people on staff that know how to yeah. use uh, them. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we do. We have that. Yeah, good. We have good. good we have good data analytics staff. <laughs> <laughs> it's the reason why I hired actually all three of them. <laughs> I'm going to just add something. Um, I don't know if the question is specific to like the P card stuff, but specifically U.S. Bank has, um, and Bob, you know this, at the port, uh, the way their system is, uh, you can actually run reports very, very specifically and kind of have it pull specific codes. They already have, um, U.S. Bank ha manages all the P cards for the state. So they kind of have these built-in tools already in that system. And um, the port actually was using something to kind of uh, catch those kind of things. Um, they created a dashboard for that. But U.S. Bank has that as long as you have access to that, and we do have access to that. Okay, thanks. Other comments, questions? Stuart. Uh, thanks. You know, um, first, it's so pleasing to hear the participation rate that you had in the risk interviews. I think this is in the four years you've been doing this by far the highest participation rate. So um, it, it's, it's great to hear. Uh, hopefully somebody will remember, I don't know, Chair, if you'll have an occasion just to really give a shout out of thanks to the board members, particularly who participated, because it's it really makes a big difference to have that participation. Maybe and, I'll just give a shout out to the one who didn't participate. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that comment. to you. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> but um, so so based on that, those interviews, right, and then based on your own working knowledge, you create this risk assessment. Yes. And so the one thing I'm curious about is, and I, maybe I somehow missed it somewhere, I'm not seeing in the documentation the, the actual risk assessment. Is that something that you have sort of like in your work papers? You have a big chart? Yeah, or, you know, so, so that will come actually um, because I'm leaving, I think it's important that uh, I kind of provide a summary. I usually don't. I usually just document it within my my annual report and consider the risks that are common and that I believe an audit would help lower or mitigate. Um, but in this case, you know, I'm leaving and so I would like to leave um, the next IPA with a more summarized type report that identifies like the main risk and then some recommendations around that. That will come in July to you. We're identified a commonality among board members and what they've seen as areas of concern in the riskiest areas, myself and what I see as a concern and, and risky areas, and then some recommendations that follow that. And so that will come in, in July to you. Got it. Okay. So, you know, a great respect for your professionalism and expertise. I have to say, you know, from my point of view, it's somewhat comforting in approving a work plan to actually see the risk assessment, because then we can say that the work plan is sort of consistent with the risk assessment. Um, you know, I'm not questioning your judgment mm -hmm. in the work plan. Everything you've got in here makes sense. I would just say from a transparency and kind of go forward basis, maybe take that in consideration that as members, at least for me, it's very helpful to see the risk 
um, assessment to provide context for the work plan. No, I understand that. So just so you know, an annual risk, so an, a risk assessment considers, it considers many things, and it's not necessarily a document. It's your professional judgment based on risk discussions, based on the environment of the organization, the inherent risk, a common, the past audits that you've performed. And so taking all of those into account is what, and using your professional judgment is what you then develop your annual plan with. It's not necessarily a document. So do I keep documents of every conversation I had with every member? I do, because that's what I can go back and refer to and go, okay, here's some commonalities. Um, or, hey, this is a, a risk area that is actually risky that I hadn't considered. And then all of that is what is commingled into this annual plan. So it's not necessarily one document. The only reason I'm doing it different this time and bringing an actual risk document to you that's that kind of lays out what are some of the three major kind of areas of risk that I identified and the commonalities and also some recommendations is just because it, I think it's information that is going to be useful moving forward as I leave and, and exit. It's not necessarily something that was required to have an annual plan. No, no, I hear, and I respect that different auditors have different approaches. It's something I've seen in other contexts. I think, like I said, for me as a committee member, and I think also, frankly, for the public, it can be helpful that there be that kind of transparency. But then this last question, if I could, related to that, mm -hmm. I have to say, I'm just curious, and I'm not asking you to violate the, you know, the interview confidentiality of any individual members. I have to say, I'm just kind of curious. One of the things that, and I know we've talked about this, but one of the things I think actually is the biggest risk for the agency, and it's not maybe a traditional auditing kind of risk, but is the notion of how hard the job is to be a board member for this agency, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a, uh, you know, I don't mean this disparaging way. It's like a part-time job for people who typically have at least three other jobs. Right. And so that difficulty of assimilating, you know, we were talking earlier about the issue of the bond measure and that people are not experts in bond measures. Right. So it's really a challenge for the agency to deliver to decision makers the information in ways that helps them, you know, assimilate, understand and then make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. I'm curious in that if in that interview process you actually hear anything like that from board members that one of their challenges is in fact just you know keeping up with the information mm -hmm. and being able to assimilate the information in ways to make good decisions and if that you know and I don't know that this is an audit per se mm -hmm. but that if that just informs you know, ongoing challenge for the agency to try to continue to improve that dynamic of how they're providing information to board members. And that's sort of what I'll be bringing. That's what the, some, some of the information that I think is useful. It's not an audit, right? So it's not an audit, but it is a risk to the organization that I think management should be aware of and the organization overall should be aware of. And, and one of those risks that I will be bringing um, is the, the overall kind of feeling that there's a lot of information overload. A lot of the board members felt, because that's one of the questions, um, is how do you feel the information being brought to you in decision-making? Is it sufficient? Is it timely? Is it relevant? And one of the, the issues or the, the concerns was, is that it, there's a lot of information. Some said there's not enough. Some said there's a lot too much. And a lot of them said there's enough, but it's very disorganized. And it's not organized in a manner that is feasible for them to go through in a very short time. A lot of them don't have staff. Um, so, the, you know, one of the things I discussed with them is a potential for a fact sheet, sort of a pros and cons. What did you consider? A lot of them felt that, that not enough risk was kind of, though it may be considered, it's not documented and it's not being discussed. It's not being brought out sort of like a fact sheet that says, here's the risk we considered. Here's what we mitigate, how we mitigate those risks. Here's the pros and cons. So they were really would like to see a more organized, the information more organized and summarized with that information available should they want to dig deeper, but it to be sort of a one-page fact sheet that says, here's your pros and cons, here's your risk, here's how we mitigate those risks. Here's the options we considered instead of just bringing an option for them to vote on. So a lot of them really wanted to see that. So I'm going to, that's what I'm summarizing and bringing is, is a kind of a benefit for management. 
So what you were talking about is something I did when I first got here, and it should be done every five years, and that's an organizational-wide risk assessment. And I did do that, and it is really looking at the organization through all levels and a holistic standpoint. That was a 60-page report that actually measured um, both verbally and and in charts and against the the depth of a risk from all perspectives within the organization, including board members, and that was a helpful um, report. I, I did pass that along to to Ray, but you know it's it's about four years old, and I did pr provide a heat a heat map that should have been um, kept up as well. That would have been useful for the organization to quarter, sort of look at at one glance. Where's my hot spots in the organization? And that sort of wasn't kept up as well. Well, um, but it's something that I would hope that when the new IPA comes in, that they take some time and maybe after they've gotten comfortable here a little bit, again, initiate that organizational wide risk from all levels and, and see how they're doing compared to when I came in the risk identified. Thanks. Yeah, and just to follow on a little bit to give staff credit and uh, even the board members credit. I mean, it is something that's been thought about when I first started being on the board in 2017, one of the biggest complaints I had, which was echoed by many, is just that the staff reports wouldn't come out far enough in advance. And and the staff has made a huge effort, unfortunately, they didn't get it here to this particular week, but a huge effort to try to make sure that all the staff reports are out by the Friday week, a week prior so everybody has a week. Because honestly, you know, one of the things that, one of the things you struggle with on a board this size, and I can tell you from personal experience is when you've got 21 members, um, it's really difficult to summarize the most important things to each one of those 21 members, because what I care about is not necessarily likely to be what the mayor of Kula Vista cares about. I mean, it's just we we have such different, you know, potentially even priorities that, that the most important thing is to have the time necessary to go through the material um, so I can actually see if what I want to know is in there, even though it's I, I sure would love a, a great summary. But a great summary can do you a disservice if it actually keeps you from reading the rest of the material and the stuff you want in that material because the summary wasn't written with you as the audience in mind. So it's it's a it's it's as you raise, it's a very complicated problem. Um, maybe we should just say all board members get regular salaries and just have to quit their other jobs. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I think if a summary is just a one page, I'm not necessarily speaking to summarizing for emotion. Right. I'm, no, I'm speaking summarizing for facts. So like every you go through a thought process when you're trying to make decide what's the best option to bring to the board and not sharing that thought process doesn't comfort the board so sharing that thought process of here's all the options here's the pros and cons of those options here's the risk here's what we selected and why here's the risk that we we still have with this option and how to mitigate those risks it's very factual it's not emotional at all so bringing those summarized facts then allows board members to introduce their own emotions to that and let them make their own decisions based on facts versus anything else. Yeah, understood. And I applaud the effort. And <laughs> just saying it, it's a very challenging thing to do um, from my personal experience. Relative to the audit plan, the uh, I guess the one question I have, oh, did I not do public comment yet on this one? I thought I already asked for public comment. I did receive one additional if you'd like to take it. <laughs> Okay, that's fine. Yes, As I thought I already did it, but that's fine. We can take our public another com public comment. Uh, can you hear me? My apologies to the committee. I just, this will be short, but I just as a public person, maybe that's why. There's uh, in the plan. There are. Oops. Let me get my thing back. There we go. Um, just two things that I would at some point uh, like a clarification as a non uh, uh, auditor person, but in the goals two and five or the OIPA goal on page two of seven, I believe it, the statement timely with their tasks and dual testing. I'd be interested if the timeliness affected the finance aspects during COVID and things like that on the previous reports. Was this added to it? Is this just a continuation of the normal practices? And they were okay before and they're gonna be continued. And then the dual testing, I'm just not familiar with in audits and it didn't come up. And at some point in the future, perhaps you'd address it. Thank you. Thank you. And. Um... So they, I do realize that you prepared the 
the annual accomplishments a while ago for them, but I just wanted to confirm that um, in the ones that you had prepared, there were still four, four of them listed as in progress. So at this point, since we're a lot further along and we only have three weeks left, do we feel like all four of those will be done by the end of this month? Yeah, okay. well, the, yeah, they'll be done within the allotted budget for this year. Right. They may spill over to next year, but okay. that's for the new hours that are also in next year's budget. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, that's fine. Um, although I think most of the four, the travel reimbursements and the, well, minor asset we just talked about, but the travel reimbursements, I don't think are continuing into this year, are they? Oh, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. They are $300. Okay, that makes sense. And then um, with respect to the update that you gave earlier, the um, on the asset one is the, so the work related to that will fall into the, the 200 hours allocated to work with management support and other on other caps as necessary. Yep. That's where we think that one will yep. fit. Okay. And that's really, you know, it's really important to understand that um, the auditors can't prepare the corrective action plan and can't tell them what to do and how to do it, but we can provide guidance and samples and all that. And that's what we intend to do. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Those were the questions I had relative to this item. So with that, if, Others are feeling comfortable. I'd entertain a motion to approve the audit plan and forward it to the board. I'll move. Second. Uh, motion by Halper and second by Drucker. Can we call for the vote, please? Thank you. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And with that, we now move on to our. Last regular item, which is number eight, the audit committee's need to retain independent counsel. And this was something brought forward by Mary. I think you're taking this, right? Yeah, I, I think it's a shared in the past. It's been kind of discussed. So I'll, I'll open up just by saying that part of um, the risk assessment, this did come up. Um, it came up in two different areas, but I'll discuss the, the area around audit committee. So it is it has been the feeling um, that according to AB 805, we should be completely independent from management. And currently the general counsel reports to management. So anything that we audit, we audit around not just management, but uh, also the general counsel's office. So around policies, anything like that, when we're auditing around that and we have a difference of opinion, it's difficult to then go to the general counsel, which the findings around and ask for their opinion on it. So I think this, um, in addition to other things in the past, it's important that the audit committee and OPA have an independent counsel that we can go outside to when needed, when it's around matters that require a second opinion around something, especially if it's an audit or that we're auditing around the general counsel's office or a policy, that we're able to reach out to an independent counsel and get that independent perspective. Um, so with that, that's my suggestion is that we seek um, some funds to be set aside where we can get a independent counsel and have them sort of on call when needed um, and that we assure that that counsel has not been a part of um, consulting with management, you know, at least currently or in the past five years. Okay, thanks. Do we have any public comment on this one? We do have uh, one member of the public who'd like to speak, the original draw. You can go ahead when you're ready. Um, I appreciate that, Mary. I think that is actually important um, because you shouldn't have to go to the management when it could involve them for an opinion. Um, it's important that, you know, whoever is doing this job is able to do it and hold it accountable um, you know, this board just to make sure that they are doing things that are um, in line. Um, but just kind of going back to before when you were talking about the recruitment for that, if Mary's going to be here until October of 2024, I feel like it's almost as if there's a push as though it's going to be this October that you're going to need to replace her. And I'm sure that is for an extended period of time to give you room um, to find somebody. But I feel like if you have that amount of time that you should really be um, looking into who's going to be filling this type of a position um, and, uh, you know, make sure that um, like it is 
quality over just quantity. So, um, and I would hope that you wouldn't bring in the whole, um, you know, equity, diversion, and inclusion to then have to pick somebody because of their race, sexuality, or something else. It should be determined upon their ability to do the job, not outside factors that are pushing a whole different agenda. So, um, yeah. And I think, you know, I don't know, I guess I could also be confused that you are finding a replacement for Mary, but you're also um, wanting to retain independent counsel outside of that. So it would be like another auditor that you would be seeking. Um, in addition to that, I don't know if somebody can answer that, but I guess, um, yeah, that's my question. Thank you, that concludes the public comments. Thank you. And yeah, just for the record, so Mary doesn't get feeling too much undue pressure here. Yes, her, I believe her retirement date is still settled in as October of this year and not October of 2024. Stuart was just making a, a unfortunate joke, which is probably gonna come back and haunt him for a little while now. <laughs> that's, that's right. So with that, um, yeah, let's have some discussion here. I'm interested to hear other people's thoughts on this. The the one thing that I do think that just from context setting, you know, the one thing that I do think gets a little bit lost is something I think is a helpful context is that there really are three somewhat independent entities here, which is one, you have the OIPA office, which is truly independent of SANDAG's board and to, to the extent of it's supposed to be doing its own work. Then you have the board and um, and what they're trying to accomplish, and then you have the audit committee. And um, you know the one thing that uh, one thing that's it's worth noting, and, and you know as we do this, we have to figure out you know our objective. And this kind of even came up in my mind. Our objective should be to be making recommendations to the board, knowing what they're looking for, and trying to make sure that they get um, uh, get the right right guidance um, going to them and, um, that helps them make the decision that they should be making from the perspective of meeting their goals and accomplishments as well. And, you know, I think an example here would be even just talking about the last audit, Stuart had uh, expressed to me some concern, which I wholly, wholly agreed with that it's a val valid concern that's like, well, possibly one of the things that was problematic with the first audit that didn't go very well um, with the, on salaries and compensation was that it was an incomplete uh, divisive thing that went to the board as opposed to something that was worked out in this group. And I think it's very important for us to do our best to make sure that we do the body of work here and with a clear, concise recommendation. Um, so as we go down, you know, exploring this path, I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that I think that, you know, relative to my comment that I think that's very crisp and clear and because uh, you know, I, I get curious too, and I totally empathize with uh, with the you know the perspective that Mary brought up. It it makes me want to go back, and I figure probably by the time I um, retire from this position, I'll have AB eight hundred five memorized. But the, is that if you look at AB eight hundred five, um, the uh, it really only stipulates three responsibilities for this committee in that bill. One of which is to uh, approve the annual audit plan, the other one, which is to make a recommendation for the auditor, and the other one, which is to make a recommendation for the financial audit. Um, beyond that, in AB 805, it basically says the board will dictate the responsibilities of this committee. So, you know, to that degree, we are actually um, supposed to be an extension of the board. They're supposed to be telling us what to do. So I just think, you know, that's something to keep in mind as we go through the, the discussion, because, you um, um, you know, I think part of our responsibility is is to make sure OIPA stays independent, but it's also to act act with the knowledge that we're supposed to be helping the board accomplish their objectives as well. So it's a funny fine line to balance in, but I think, you know, relative to the comment that I already made that, um, that about what my earlier conversation with Stuart is, I do think the more complete, uniform, solid recommendation that we can send to the board the more likely uh, our work will go smoothly. And so making sure any any concerns get uh, uh, fleshed out at this level is best. And how do we go about doing that? So having started out saying that, I'm interested to hear other people's comments or thoughts. 
Well, this is a quiet group today. So interesting, at a recent board meeting, that question came up about who does the general counsel work for? Does the general counsel work for the organization or does he work for the board? You know, I asked our city attorney at one point. That was point, not a very clear answer that was given either, but it, no, it no, is, it, it is it a was. clear, there should have been a clear answer. Right. <laughs> um, it, you can't be in that position for very long without taking the position of, I'm here to protect the organization, whether it's the board in conjunction with the, the bylaws or the general operations. So I think it tends to set up, if not adversarial, at least some conflict with the group that has oversight over the operations of the organization being the OIPA. And if they don't have an independent counsel to refer to, who is dispassionate about what's going on within the organization and just clearly looks at AB 805, the bylaws, you know, policy 39, this is what you've done. Yes, we think you're on a good path here. Um, no disrespect to Mr. Kirk, but he has an obligation to the board and to the organization, not to OIPA. And so I think you really do need to draw that line and offer that opportunity, either budgetarily on retainer, or however it's going to be set up. I think it, um, at some point there will always be an issue that pops up. We had it with the credit card. Something else will come down the road at some point. And when the public looks to see what we've done as an organization to ensure as much um, independence for the OIPA, not having that legal counsel to rely upon outside of the general counsel's office, I think is a tragic mistake if we don't do it. Yeah, uh, one of the things that actually, I'll get back to that second. One of the questions I actually did want to ask because it's funny, um, I was actually looking for something else. And when I did this, I came up upon the agenda item from May 2020 in which this topic was discussed in May of 2020 before I was on there. And the outcome of that was for the the chair, Bill Baber at that time and the public, <laughs> <laughs> and the public member, um, Paul Dostart, I guess maybe, mm -hmm. to Paul set up Dostart. a subcommittee and go off and work with contracts to co potentially come up with a contract that it would allow for an on-call attorney, but I couldn't find any follow-up. Can someone enlighten me as to what happened to that effort? It okay, it just died. Well, it never got started, really. I mean, okay. you, were, you were two attorneys that had their own perspective, and I'm not sure it was the perspective or the best interest, frankly, of the audit committee or the OPA or SANDAG um, that went off and did nothing, pretty much. But yeah, it did, it did, it did die. Okay, well, that, that explains it. I just but know. to complete the story, yeah. um, independent counsel was in fact hired for, that one for the audit of the compensation practices. And I think it was, I think it was Paul actually by himself that went off and did that. Yes. Yeah. But, okay. After he re rewrote the audit report. Well, the final, that's yeah. different. <laughs> So, 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 so it actually, so there is precedent. We actually, did, the committee actually did hire independent counsel right. specific to well, that audit. Right, matter. right, yes. right. And yes, I understood. So I get that. The um, so that's good to know because I was just curious. I was like, wow, there was an action taken, but I never saw anything come out of it. But then, yeah, relative to, uh, I just think you know, I and this this originally in full transparency came on the agenda as discussion possible action. I said, can we just make a discussion this time so we can all have a discussion and think about it and then come back and talk about it again. Um, but relative to your point, Ed, I mean, that's that is the interesting thing. The one thing that I've and I think we all need to think about, which is how we go about doing it. Uh, if, if we head down this path, uh, how we go about resolving things at this committee is that um, is that. Uh, is that my perspective is that one, if attorneys didn't agree, disagree, we wouldn't need courts, right? And so clearly attorneys disagree all the time on, on language. And so the other thing I've noticed is, and I, I appreciate your point, and I almost wonder if one of the recommendations, although Amberling, you may know if this is even possible, if it's just a board policy, would be that John should report to the board or the, the actual uh, attorney should appoint to the board as opposed to, as opposed to Hassan, because that's the way it works in my city. The city attorney actually reports to the city council as opposed to the city manager. And I think that could provide more confidence as well. And is there just sorry. a heads up, 
yeah. on that because yeah. <laughs> you're going to bring it up. Um, that is one of the risks, the high risks identified during the discussion with board right. members is who should the general counsel be reporting to. And so one of the recommendations that's going to come to the risk assessment along with the risk assessment is to consider having the general counsel report directly to the board. Okay. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's a conversation that could potentially happen if, if it was a recommendation even from this group. Certainly, and maybe I would just offer up an answer to Council Member Musgrove's question, who is the client and how do you know? Yeah. And that really comes from the rules of professional conduct that's, that tell us who the client is. And I would refer to rule 1.13 that says the client is the organization, organization itself acting through its duly authorized directors. So in this case, it is the organization acting through the board of directors. Yeah, and, um, and you know, I was just gonna go back to my point, uh, which is, I don't know how everyone here works in their own organizations, but at our city, when we use our city attorney as the board of directors, or in this case, the city council, we're looking at for her how to figure out how to implement the policy that we want, right? And that means that she's interpreting the law, you know, legally, uh, permissibly, but in a way that allows us to implement the policy we want. And so we just have to be prepared for, in my mind, that that um, if there's a disagreement between the board and OIPA or the board and management on how something looks, then you're going to end up very possibly with two things coming here with two attorneys, both respected, and I respect Amber Lynn, would value her opinion that are interpreting it differently. And I'm, and I, we'd have to figure out how to make sure that gets resolved. But on the flip side, um, I do think there is some value here from the perspective of, because Mary brings up a really good point, is if we have to actually investigate something inside that particular office, um, we would need, you know, the concept of how do we go about acquiring outside counsel subject to clearly there's been precedence before already. Um, um, so I would assume that if it was something that would get set up, it likely wouldn't be used regularly. And it's just a question of what, what that would look like. and. Uh, how it will get triggered. Any other comments? Ms. Wong Nickerson. Yeah, I do appreciate your earlier comments that we do have different independent, you know, board or entity or committees. However, we also have experienced in the past, there are times that we just couldn't come to agreement, even within the auto committee, right, for issues. So I do think there are value and utility having a third party, you know, ideally, you know, don't have the complicated, you know, obligations to feel that they need to protect the institution and can, you know, look at things, hopefully very objectively, or at least have a third opinion, you know, just like a second opinion um, that can help this committee and hopefully the board to to kind of get more clarity on certain issues because I do think that is problematic. I mean, the first audit I wasn't here, but I did read about it in the paper, and that wasn't a really good thing for the institution, right? That it, because it's unresolved here, and then now it got escalated to actually the wrong place to have it resolved there. So I would much prefer if we have some t additional tools when it's needed. Uh, get things resolved here, right? Then we can go to the board with a unified, you know, voice uh, and avoid issues like that. So this might be one tool to, you know, give us, you know, additional resources to get there. So that's my, I, I don't see, I think as long as we use it very, not like every time we don't agree on something and, and go out, find some someone, you know, to be the judge, uh, but use it very sparingly only when it's really necessary. So, Oh, you want to add something? Yeah, um, just a couple of things. When I was at the port, um, we had three employees that were direct reports to the board. Uh, it was myself as the, the port auditor, uh, the CEO, and the port attorney. Um, and they were completely independent of each other. Um, so again, as as the chief audit executive, I, I made the, the professional judgment that we didn't need outside because I could go to the port attorney. Uh, we even audited his his department. So I, but there was that independence buffer between the two and as well as with management. So that's where when I come to this and start thinking about it, I I think it is a good idea. 
Um, I understand that there could be some unintended consequences where there's going to be disagreements and we as an audit committee need to figure out what that process is going to be so that we're not taking that disagreement into the board and we have circumstances like we had at that very first audit. Um, do I think we can do that? I think so. Uh, well, let me probe a little bit then. I mean, if you thought it worked well at a port authority, is a possible alternative approach is to encourage the structure to be changed so that you do have an independent in my mind. If you, if you could do that again, I don't know the the all the legal basis or anything else like that. Okay. At the port, it was very specific in in the legislature that there were three positions. Right. Um, so I don't know how it's structured here. Uh, in the law, that's that's something that Amber Lynn would have to, uh, or, or John Kirk, and that's nothing to say that, that, that I don't have any disrespect for John Kirk or Amber Lynn. I think they've been doing a great job. Um, but again, it get back, it gets back to the independence, um, and there may be times I wouldn't think we would use it very often. Um, I know I've been on the, this committee with Stuart for six, seven years now, if I, something like that, lost count. Um, um, and there's only been that one time. Um, so I wouldn't think we would be, it would be used often. It shouldn't be used often. Um, but I, I, I'm leaning towards in favor of it, unless there is a way that the board could make the attorney's office independent. And I think Mary would be much more agreeable with that. Uh, I don't mean to make put words in her mouth, but but uh, yeah, no, it, it okay. would. It, I would be in agreement with that. And and looking at other organizations that I've worked for, all of them, the general yeah. counsel reported directly to the board fully and was as independent as I was and the CEO was. Uh, it's how most organizations, public organizations are structured. And it it's not just for the protection of OPA or for the board or for management, but also for the protection of the general counsel, the position, not the person. Um, and and them feeling that they can fully do their, their job without the fear of retaliation of any kind. And so just like myself, that's why I report directly to the board and not to management. And so I think that... Um, that was one of the risks that were brought up that I'm going to be rec making the recommendation that the board consider um, the general counsel and his office reporting directly to the board. David, I think you were going to jump in. Yeah. So um, first of all, every other public agency that I'm involved with, the uh, attorney reports directly to the board and, and is hired by the board. Um, that is my city council, North County Transit District, um, Clean Energy Asso Association, um, all we as a board hire the board. And I, I had thought, you know, even though I've been in, I've been involved with Sandag, that, that was pretty much the way it was going to would work here. But obviously, that hasn't because I don't think the board has ever hired a city, uh, an attorney directly. It's always been the management, but I think that's an important step that the uh, board and the organization need to think about. Until that time, you know, do we need, I don't believe we need a full-time attorney. Yeah, there may be some times where we need that. And, uh, you know, we just need to probably put some parameters on that to make sure that uh, the board would feel comfortable if they don't create that separation, that we would have the ability to do that and then add needed as needed basis. Well, not to get down too down and dirty, David, but I'll let you know your poop gets treated by a board where the attorney actually is a hired by this, the chief executive, which is the San Alejo Joint Powers Authority. So I actually sit on one example of a counter example. But I'm not on that board. We're, not, on, we're not at that board. I know. We're not allowed. Well, you, you haven't bought into it yet. So anyway, but no, yes. We, we, it, we uh, but, you. But I, <laughs> but we, uh, anyway, but yes, I, I agree that, uh, that, um, that that seems to be a more logical arrangement. And so anyway, so that's the discussion. I think it sounds like it's still, oh, Stuart. 
Yeah, sorry. So just for clarification, I think you just did the clarification. We're talking about an as needed, not a full time scenario. Yeah, yeah this right. would definitely have to be as needed. But then we also then need to talk about what it might look like, <laughs> right. uh, how that gets triggered, when it's going to come up and uh, how that would work. And then I'm also, you know, if, if we're going to go down that part, path, figure out what what the cost would look like and you know, clearly, at least with respect to this year, we just passed the budget. So then, then it turns into the complicated question. So if I can just add some perspective, yeah. um, you know, the city of San Diego has been battling about this for years, and um, um, there's some chance it may become a ballot measure to modify the city charter to um, permit this, because right now the city charter specifies that the city attorney is the attorney for the city, et cetera. But, um, but because of that, I've had a lot of time to think about this. And I, I guess from my perspective, um, and I totally recognize that attorneys have their own professional code of conduct, and I think there's merit to the argument that their professional code of conduct would actually enable them to function in sort of this duality. But at the same time, just in very practical terms, and I think Ed said it really well, um, part of what we all have to be conscious of is the, you know, the degree of public credibility of these processes, right? And I think just to the average person, it's an, it, there's an inherent logic to the fact that in a scenario if Mary were, or OIPA were doing an audit that related to the general counsel's office, I mean, it really, it even came up in the contracts, right, which I don't even know if contracts reports to the general counsel or not, but there was the issue about the permission to access information, and there was a the, uh, sort of conflict between AB 805, perhaps other statutes, right? There was sort of an implied legal conflict. Um, and so I think to the average person out there, it just makes sense that there's likely to be at some point some conflict. So to make sure that the process is totally above reproach. Isn't it in everybody's interest to say, yes, selectively, we will seek independent counsel. And the simple fact is, if the staff attorney's perspective is correct, that independent counsel is going to agree with them. And everybody feels like, oh, okay, great. If on the other hand... Well, so Stuart, if yeah. I may probe on the example that you're giving. Sure. Um, so for, as an example with what you, the, the one that you just brought up with contracts, the way I would have seen, I mean, my understanding, and you two can correct me if I'm wrong, is that the decision to not release the set of information was made by management. Is that correct? Not by, wasn't made by, it was, it was backed up by the attorney's office, but it was actually a manager that said, no, we're not going to release this information. Yeah, it, it was, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't the attorney that said, no, it was the right. management. It was backed up by the attorney, but right. that's where then there's a disagreement with the interpretation of the attorney. Was it okay based on how he, how he, the general counsel presented it as making it okay when in fact there should have been someone else to bounce that off and say, no, not actually. No, no, but well, that, let, that's let why I go, sir, if, if you take finish, that example. The, I get it, but if I can finish, you'll understand yeah. the context of yeah. why that of that example yeah. right so in a scenario where an outside counsel comes back and has a different point of view that different point of view doesn't rule right what it does do though and this is where in this case it, it could have actually played out that differing opinion informs the decision makers in this case the decision makers are the board or the audit committee. Well, the audit committee, but ultimately to David's earlier point, right. ultimately the board. So in that scenario, if I was a board member and I became aware of this dispute, I might say, well, you know, I understand the general counsel's point of view about this, but if there is a credible, independent counsel with relevant subject matter expertise who actually has a different point of view, I would want to know that in order for me to make a fully informed decision. And I think that's the benefit of the independent counsel is not that it's not like, you know, you're shopping for an opinion and then you do whatever the other person says. It's in order to help the board make the most informed decision. No, I understand that. Um, but back to my earlier point, and I'll apologize in advance. I don't mean to 
with this statement offend anybody, particularly you, Mary. But so, for example, attorneys, I mean, independent is independent, right? But attorneys are very much set up to meet the need of their client. So if the if the counsel that's hired is hired, I said, I want you to find an opinion on this. Should Sandag be able to, should Sandag be required to release this information that I want to me? That independent counsel is going to go out and find a legal argument that says, actually, that's not true. No. In the case, in the yeah, case right. where we hired independent yeah. counsel, independent independent counsel agreed with Sandag's counsel. Right. And and so yeah. You know, so it's not your, always to true. your yeah. point. But based on what you're saying, yeah, right? You'd never rely on the general counsel because the general counsel is always representing. No, no, no. I'm there, no, I'm just saying when there's gray areas, right? That's that's the way it works with gray. Yeah. I mean, it's clear, clearly, if if it's something's black and white, it's black and white. So I just have but, to yeah. to say this ethical part that we're all obligated as certified any anybody right. certified. We have an ethical standard that we should follow. Doesn't mean we always follow it. So I I push that aside. Mm -hmm. uh, just for the same reasons, I believe general counsel should report directly to the board. Or for the same reason that I am also required ethically to follow ethical standards, still have to report independently to the board. It it, it allows for that separation from management and a perspective that you're you're independent in the ability for you to do your job and not feel pressured to do your job. So that's the big change of having a direct report to the board versus to management, one. Two, having a second eye. Um, nobody is above anybody, right? Just because you're an attorney doesn't mean you're 100% right. And so if you bring someone else in, they're going to dispute you. I'm peer reviewed. Mm -hmm. And my peer reviewer can say we disagree. They're the peer reviewer. I have every one of my audits peer reviewed before it goes out the door. That's a second CPA looking at it and going, yeah, Mary, you should think about this. That's what a second attorney is. Nobody should feel like their word is the final word just because they have a license. And so that's why I'm saying that it would benefit the organization to consider either having a separate on-call type of ability for us to reach out for or to have the general counsel report independently, fully independently to the board. Yeah, and on that latter part, I think I'm guessing we're all in agreement that we, you know, if we, if we were to at least make some recommendation at some point, we'd strongly agree, recommend that the general counsel appoint a report to the board as opposed to management. I think, I mean, I would strongly prefer to see that just based upon my history with the organ with with the organizations that I work with as well. Um, but I'm just trying again, trying to figure out, uh, you know, if we get through and, you know, this is we're running to the end of time. This is something we'll continue to discuss because it sounds like there's more. But, you know, if we get to this meeting, um, it's an interesting concept of it's like, OK, if we have because even if we consult an independent counsel, I guess it just means that we will listen to Amber Lynn and this independent counsel argue a point out and decide which one we'd prefer to believe in. Well, if I could just make yeah. a final point. So, you know, to the vice chair's comment, um, the question of whether the general counsel's offer should be restructured, report to work, that's not happening anytime soon, right? The notion of us moving forward with an RFP for uh, uh, an on-call counsel, that's something could actually happen right, within our lifetimes. So I would be a proponent, you know, to try to at least move forward with that because the other thing, who knows how long that's going to take or if, it, or if it actually even has support. Um, so uh, that would be, but I understand we're going to be considering this in a formal sense at our next meeting. Is that your plan or... In a future meeting, we'll have to see how the next meeting plans okay. out with respect to all the yeah, other would, things that are on the agenda. Right. That, that <laughs> would be my request meeting. is that you, right. you give us some directive of what you're hoping to have at the next discussion, action, and that when would you like for that to come back so we can plan it for the agenda. I would like to understand more. In my God. Is that... Um, when the in, uh, OGC reports up to the board, the relationship between OGC and management change has changed. What are the downside of that? I mean, I do think it'd be good to have some better understanding because I also don't want, you know, whatever we recommend that would uh, hurt the management's ability to make the right decisions, right? So 
uh, I'm sure currently OGC and management work very closely. So I just want to have a better understanding of the downsides, making that recommendation with the board. Well, from an audit perspective, there's no downside, but I'm sure management would have a different perspective. And, and I think that that's something management should want to maybe bring back and have that discussion of what the cons would be. And, I, I, can I think give that you a degree of separation would benefit management. Um, exactly. Next Monday, we're meeting, the, our council are meeting in closed session to discuss the annual report and compensation packets for our city attorney and our city manager. We do that every year. And I remember the first time when I got on council, I asked the city, man, the city attorney a question. And she's very blunt, but she's very honest. And so I appreciate that. She says, I don't work for you as an individual. The, the city of San Marcos is my client. And that puts everything in perspective. So she will sit at council and sometimes she'll interject, we'll ask her questions, but she has a degree of independence from the city manager and really from us to that extent, mm -hmm. because she's always looking at everything from the liability and mitigation aspects for the city as a whole. And I think that's a better perspective for the general council to have. Yeah, the primary downside my, from my perspective is as a board member, it's more work because then you're responsible for doing the annual performance evaluating and compensation discussion for yet another person. But, <laughs> yes, careful what you wish for. So, you know, relative, oh, David, go ahead. I think the, the major thing is we need to have some criteria as to when we would want to, when we would want to bring on an independent consult, a cons, independent consult console. So, you know, to bring it back, that's what you were looking for. Yeah, and bringing it back in the discussion, that would be the main thing I'm looking for too, is what 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 would the framework look like as to when this would get triggered? I mean, clearly, honestly, there's some desire to know. I'm assuming if you want to have an independent uh, ability, you also probably will have to pay someone a retainer. I have no idea what that would look like cost-wise, um, which will come into play as well, but um, just to be on call. It's like an on-call engineer. Right. You know, which your your city has, my city has, a lot of cities have. Just here's a list of people that you can call. We have that. Yeah. Call. Yeah. So, okay. Any other input, guidance, thoughts? Looks like we're good. Um, so sorry for running over a few minutes. Did pretty well, I think. Um, <laughs> next meeting. <laughs> uh, Next audit committee is scheduled for Friday, July 14th, 2023. I will note again, the agenda says 1230. Don't be surprised if it's 130 again. I think the board meetings are regularly going to be scheduled to go to 1 p.m. at this point. And if not, um, if not actually at some point looking for an alternative uh, even day maybe, but at least right now it's July 14th. Um, probably 1.30 is my guess, but uh, we'll keep you all posted. Okay. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Oh, yeah, well. So, so unfortunately, I'd be out of town, and and I would really would like to be able to interview the candidates for the OIPA position. Is there any is is it possible to have Zoom at least for that portion? Well, it depends upon why you're out of town. If you're out of town for one of the reasons that is dictated in the law, <laughs> with respect to, <laughs> you can participate via Zoom. <laughs> Okay, so there are absolutely I can provide you more information what they're referring to you to are some limited opportunities for members to participate virtually under certain circumstances. Yes, so I can yes, you have to declare that. certain things and you'll have to be comfortable doing that. Uh, the thing that I don't know, which maybe you can answer Amberlynn there. The thing that I don't know, which maybe you can answer Amberlynn is whether or not Sandag supports actual just Brown Act compliant remote attendance at this point, meaning you public post the location as part of the agenda 72 hours in advance and the location must be accessible by the public. Um, that's clearly Brown Act compliant. Do we support that? It, well, under these new rules where there are certain exceptions to allow members to right. remotely uh, participate, those same requirements do not apply. I know, but I'm saying if, if Otherwise, for yes. some, I know, but do we support it? So if, if for example, if Agnes decides that uh, none of these new rules apply, her other option would be to post the location as part of the agenda 72 hours in advance. Precisely, we could facilitate we could those facilitate requirements. That yes. as well. So there are options, but you should first look at the rules that say, because that's kind of a pain, and I don't know if you're going to know where you're going to be 72 hours in advance, but some there are, there are options. Look into them and let me know, okay? Thank you. So now with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.